Loudness is one of the most fundamental characteristics of a sound, essential when balancing a mix and often a source of worry when finalizing a master. We often equate it with gain or amplitude, the thing you change as you move up and down a mix fader, but there is much more to it. Our perception of loudness depends on many more things, including the envelope and frequency content of a sound. And knowing how exactly these are related will help you make sense of many problems you will face as a producer of music. Let's start with the most obvious way to change the sound's loudness, gain. If you take one sound and add some gain, increasing the amplitude of its waveform, it'll sound louder. No surprises yet, I hope. This is the most basic way for us to adjust a track's relative loudness when mixing, simply turning a track's fader up or down. Interestingly, at this point our perception already stops acting the way we would expect it to. To increase the sound's gain by about 6 dB means to double its amplitude. However, if you ask people to subjectively judge what sounds twice as loud to them, you get a number closer to 10 dB, which is about the same as multiplying a sound's amplitude by 3.1. But so far this isn't too important. Most of us probably don't look at the numbers when we turn a fader up or down. We just adjust it till it sounds right. Next, let's do a little listening exercise. Which of these sounds is louder? A or B? I'm guessing you said B, which is where things get interesting. If we look at the two waveforms, we can clearly tell that sound A actually peaks way higher than sound B. However, sound B is sustained for longer than sound A. This is the second factor in a perception of loudness, called the temporal integration of loudness. Longer sounds feel louder than short ones, up to about 200 milliseconds. After that, the length stops mattering as much to our judgment of loudness. Let's do another listening test. These probably sounded about the same volume to you, even though A is 300 and B is 500 milliseconds long. They're both long enough that the temporal integration effect isn't nearly as drastic. This time dependence of loudness is the reason your door meters don't just show you the peak value of a track as little lines at the top, they also show you the RMS, root mean squared, a running average of loudness over time visible as a solid color bar. It's no coincidence that RMS measurements usually use a 200 to 400 mm second window, the time period that is most relevant to our judgment of a sound's loudness. So louder means louder for longer, especially when it comes to shorter sounds like transients. Headroom however is a limited resource, a rendered waveform can never exceed 0 dB. This is why people go through all sorts of trouble with clippers, limiters and compressors to rein in the peaks of their sounds to let them turn the body up. The aim is always to do this in a transparent way, preserving as much punch and dynamics as possible, but of course there will always be a trade-off. A good way to tune your ears to the damage you might be doing to the sound is to use auto gain when setting up your clipper or limiter. This way you'll be less distracted by the gained loudness when listening to the added distortion and loss of dynamics. Back to the science, let's do a third listening test. I'll play you two different sounds and you tell me which one is louder. To me, sound B sounded clearly louder than sound A. From looking at their waveforms, we can tell both their amplitude and their duration are exactly the same. Things will however appear a little different on a spectrum analyzer. This hints at the third aspect that goes into our judgment of a sound's loudness, frequency. Our ears are biased to judge some frequencies much louder than others. If you repeated this kind of experiment many more times on a variety of test subjects, you would be able to deduce something known as the fletcher munson curves, or equal loudness contours. But this graph is showing our lines along which people tend to judge sounds as the same loudness, across a graph of frequency on the x and gain on the y-axis. That means that a tone at 2k peaking here will be heard as the same loudness as a sound around 200 Hz peaking here. Our hearing is far more sensitive around 2K, while towards the top and bottom you need to add a lot more gain to the sounds for people to judge them as the same loudness. So to approximately match their loudness we'll need to turn sound A up quite a bit. I've heard various possible explanations from this, from an evolutionary bias towards the frequency at which babies cry to our eardrums physically resonating at 2k. What's important to us here is less the why and more the simple fact that our ears perception of loudness is anything but flat, it's heavily biased towards certain frequencies. You've probably heard about LUFS before and now you will be able to understand what they really are. They're a kind of average measurement similar to RMS, but now we apply an EQ curve to the sound before measuring its loudness 
to make the computer hear it a bit more like us humans. Specifically, a low cut filter at 80 Hz and a high shelf of plus 4 dB at 2 kHz. This filter curve, called a K weighting, is roughly imitating the kind of frequency bias we saw in the Fletcher Munson curves. As you already can tell, this is not at all a perfect model of how humans hear loudness, but it's a better approximation than RMS. So these are some of the takeaways for you as a producer. First of all, neither your DAW's meters nor your song's waveform are a reliable way to tell how loud a piece of audio will sound. Remember, this treats the same volume on your meters as this and loves aren't perfect either. You saw for example how they completely omitted that our ears start getting less sensitive above about 5 kHz again. Ironically, the loudest possible sound measurable in loves is going to be a sine wave at exactly half your sample rate, well above 20k and completely inaudible to most humans. Secondly, let's think about mix balance a bit more. If we want our basses and kick drum to be nice and loud, we'll need to turn them up to peak a lot higher than our cymbals, which means these sounds will be taking up most of our headroom. In addition to this, if we want our basses to sound even louder, we could consider adding some upper harmonics by synthesizing some mid bass layers for them to take advantage of our ears increased sensitivity in those areas. Talk to any dubstep or tear out producer, they'll know all about this. If you work in a genre where this isn't an option, a little saturation adding upper harmonics can still go a long way. On the opposite side of things, we can also consult these equal loudness contours to make an educated guess about frequencies that sound too loud, like unpleasant resonances. I see a lot of beginner producers assume harshness always comes from the high end, but that's only half true. As the Fletcher Munson curves show, our ear sensitivity actually decreases again quite a bit above 5 to 6k. So if you're on the hunt for a resonance that's bothering you, you really want to start at around 2 or 3000 hertz and not in the very top end. And if you want to control a mix, general sharpness, a broad dip in that area might get you much better result than a high shelf that will also remove a lot of nice and harmless sparkle in the very high end. And lastly, loudness is not everything. Yes, the more you clip and limit away your transients, the higher you will be able to push the perceived loudness of your drums. But will they ever sound as punchy and clear as percussions where the transients are left clearly poking out in the waveform? And yes, the less bass your song has, the louder you will be able to make it. But will it ever have the same weight and impact as a deep dubstep beat where the sub bass is by far the loudest element of the mix. As with everything in audio there is always a trade off. And with loudness normalization to around negative 14 to negative 10 LUFS integrated on most streaming services, pushing much louder than that will simply get your mix to be played quieter to match it with their standards. I'm not saying you should never master really loud, I'm simply saying if it makes your mix sound worse, it's probably not worth it. That's it on loudness. In the next part of the series, we'll tackle one of the most important ideas in mixing, masking. There are a lot of ideas in psychoacoustics that can help us make sense of the subject. In the meantime, if you want to support the creation of these videos and learn some more about music production and sound design, consider signing up for a channel membership for access to my bonus videos and whole courses on various subjects like drum production, Bitwix Studio, sound design and vital, or Bitwix Beautiful Grid. I also offer private lessons if you want to work on specific subjects with me in a one-on-one -on -one call, need feedback on a mix, wants to learn how to make a certain sound or anything else you need help with. See you in part two. Cheers.